Hi, Teardown Times today, and here we've got some big old, formerly very expensive. Here we've got some um, originally very expensive bits of laboratory kit. Um, we have an AC30 nitrogen oxide analyzer and two different sulfur dioxide analyzers. Um, this is a pulse fluorescence SO2 analyzer, and again, this is also another fluorescent sulfur dioxide analyzer. Um, these are basically for measuring the concentrations of specific gases um, for analytical, environmental monitoring, etc. I picked these up for peanuts on eBay from a lab that was clearing out and I thought they'd just be interesting to um, take a look inside. Now quite easily one of these actually came with a manual, it's got quite a lot of information because these are very highly specialised niche bits of equipment, um, it's not uncommon to get quite detailed information in the manuals. Um, this dates from November 1982, so it's about a 30 year old piece of kit, made by a French company called Environment SA, or the Environment SA. And almost sort of the first thing, the sort of general description here, and it almost sort of straight away dives in to all the internal parts and also detailed description of um, how it actually works. All these analyzers use some phenomenon which is basically optically detected. It's either um, fluorescence or luminescence, so they produce a chemical reaction that produces an amount of light, and the amount of light gives information about how much of the gas of interest is. Um, present. And this one actually uses ozone, so there's actually an ozone generator in there. That then produces a reaction in a sort of reaction chamber and then the light produced from that is then measured using a photomultiplier. So we've got a quite detailed drawing here. So we've got gas coming in, we've got an oven which presumably converts different types of um, oxides, ozone generator, then a reaction chamber. This one actually measures two things at the same time. They use Most of these use a, a chopper for the um, optical detection. The reason for that is it's much easier to detect an AC signal because um, it effectively auto zero. So they measure a reference black and then they let the light through and measure that. And by looking at the difference between there, you eliminate a lot of the potential errors due to offsets and so on. And this actually has two chambers and two, uh, a two section chopper so that it measures two different things alternately as the chopper goes round and produces the uh, results for uh, NO and NOx. And this uses a molybdenum converter, I assume that, that sort of catalyst type thing, um, running at 350 degrees C. And this is very, very sensitive, I and mean, this can actually detect 0 0.002 ppm uh, parts per million, so that's sort of two parts per billion, so it's an extremely sensitive piece of um, equipment. So this um, includes quite a lot of sort of schematic details. This is the um, actual gas circuit. So we've got an uh, inlet to the ozone generator, which I think is just filtered air, ozone generator, a flow meter, um, restrictions to control the um, amount of gas going through, then the actual reaction chamber, um, the sample gas going through this one path going through this oven, the other path going directly, um, another flow rate indicator, pressure gauges, a carbon filter, and a vacuum pump to actually pull the uh, gas through. And this is the um, ozone generator. This is basically using high voltage to um, convert some of the oxygen in the air into ozone. And there's a nice sort of four and a half kV um, transformer in there, which I'm sure we have some fun with later. This is the um, converter oven, a glass vial with pure molybdenum chippings. And when in contact with the metal uh, at 350 degrees C, uh, NO2 break down into NO and O2, and this this uh, molybdenum is a, is a consumable. One thing about things like gas analyzers, you know, you, you think about test equipment like oscilloscopes or whatever, you just you know, they just carry on working almost forever. Whereas things like this, as soon as you start getting into chemicals, you have to bit there's parts that are going to need regular replacement, filters that need replacement on a very regular basis. So, although these things were very expensive originally, they're probably pretty much worthless because you almost certainly can't get all the replacement parts and consumables that you need. And here's the diagram of the uh, photomultiplier assembly. Um, we've got a chopper motor, um, the actual chopper window, some optical filters to filter the wavelengths. And interesting, this has also got a Peltier cooler, so it's actually cooling the photomultiplier tube um, to reduce its noise, just to improve, in, improve performance, because again it's detecting very small amounts, and I hopefully I'll hook up the photomultiplier and actually get some idea of how sensitive it is um, in terms of light sensitivity, but photomultipliers are generally the way of 
getting very high sensitivity light measurements even to this day. I mean there are a few alternatives like electron multiplying CCDs and avalanche photodiodes but photomultipliers are still actually quite common for yeah, very high sensitivity uh, light sensing. And we've got this nice um, schematic of the electronics as well. We've got this sort of purple um, diozo chemical copying uh, process. So this is sort of in hand drawn and they, 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 these copies are actually produced by a sort of photochemical process. Um, it looks like it uses a sort of 7109 which is a standard um, front pe uh, panel meter chip. Um, we've got the photomultiplier amplifier and just a few general bits of analog signal process. This is all fairly sort of fairly analog here. There's the electronics are actually rel relatively straightforward. A lot of it's just down to sort of calibration and um, zeroing and things like temperature control of the Peltier, handling the photomultiplier, etc. Going to give you a nice uh, layout drawing of the uh, PCB, nice and serviceable. And it gives you all the. This does actually. This, this does have um, a fairly basic processor in it. It's got a Z80 based uh, processor board in there. Well, it, I think it's using the, um, the panel meter chip as an HD converter. And again, there's just a block diagram and processor board and some uh, layout drawings. These are all nicely sort of hand hand-drawn and good old-fashioned hand-drawn taped PCB layouts. One interesting little detail on this photomultiplier amp, this is clearly a very high impedance system because we've got a 100 meg and 250 meg resistor there and obviously it's using a FET input op amp. Um, they're using a sort of packaged high voltage converter which is driven by um, a standard M317 regulator and that's actually there's a calibration adjustment here that controls the uh, photomultiplier voltage. Well, I think it's always worth doing if you're taking apart stuff like this that might have useful modules is to actually just fire it up and just like measure the voltages just so you know what, what, what these things are expecting to be driven by because yeah, photo, quite often photo multipliers you find they've got like a standard power supply maybe sometimes even a, a standard amplifier so those are actually quite useful modules. Right, let's take a quick look at the electronics first. It's all fairly straightforward. A bunch of relays. These will be to turn on and off the various sort of systems like the motors and so on. Um, Big and small mains transformer, a few linear voltage regulators, nothing particularly exciting. Um, some various sort of analog circuitry, all the chips are in um, nice 10 pin sockets for serviceability. Um, this little can here, this is the um, photomultiplier power supply, and three boards in uh, edge connectors. There's um, one unpopulated one there, which is probably for some uh, option. Processor board which is just basically Z80 and this other board which is driving the uh, display it's got a fluorescent display on the front panel um, this little can here I think that's a shielding can around the photomultiplier amplifier because it was shown in a little circle on the schematics I assume the skirt circle indicated the, um, the fact that it was in a can it looks like the, um, they've actually used a different op amp this is an OPA121 which is different from the one the schematic so it could be that this is a later version than that schematic right with well that huge um, electronics board out of the way uh, we can now get a close, close look at what's in here this is the vacuum pump the plumbing on this doesn't quite correspond with the manual so I think this is probably a slightly different version um, we've got the inlet to the ozone um, generation so it's got its own dedicated input and I'm guessing um, I don't know whether this would normally be fed with air or ozone but if, you, if you're trying to detect tiny tiny concentrations of gas the last thing you want is for sort of con contamination to be going into your um, ozone generator so maybe that can be fed via like a high purity source or a, you know, a bottle of oxygen or something um, that seems to go through this filter um, now this thing, I'm not quite sure what this is, um, I suspect it might be some sort of shut off valve or something that just keeps the system sealed but there's um, that's the input to the ozone generator and then that goes out to the ozone generator and there's another one that goes to the vacuum so I wonder if that's actually some sort of vacuum operated valve that just shuts, just shuts off the um, feed to the ozone generator when the vacuum pump's not running just to avoid any uh, anything sort of creeping in there but we'll take that apart later and uh, have a look at that um, so on the back this is the uh, carbon activated carbon filter um, this seems to be filtering um, basically the stuff that's going out so it's probably just getting rid of any nasties that um, before sort of sending them out uh, the back end just some sort of 
a few bits of filter in here and some uh, charcoal at the bottom. Um, this is the oven assembly, so that heats up the uh, sample to 350 degrees C. So it's full of um, insulation. Um, this is the ozone generator. Nice big uh, danger high voltage load on it. And then these are the, just the big high voltage transformer. And then this uh, reaction chamber. And this is the main uh, reaction chamber. Interesting warning on here. Um, don't change injectors under strong light. Now I suspect that's not to do with the injectors but to do with the photomultiplier because certainly when they're switched on photomultipliers can be damaged by um, high light levels. Um, I don't know to what extent they can be damaged when it's switched off but it's plausible that there might be some residual charge on there so that even when you turn it off it could be the photomultiplier is still sensitive to um, damage. So this is the actual reaction chamber. We've got a transistor on here which I'm sure is going to be used as a, a heater and this will be a temperature sensor because obviously being a chemical process this thing's going to be super sensitive to a temperature so that has to be tightly controlled got this synchronous motor here which will be driving the uh, chopper fan on there again this there's two heat sinks again this this will be down to the peltier cooling of the photomultiplier on the front panel we've got two um flow meters and a vacuum gauge all right so this is the um ozone generator we've got this uh nice little high voltage transformer on the bottom high voltage going inside this Tube. These ends feel like they're made of Teflon, which has also got good chemical resistance and obviously also good high voltage properties. And so it looks like we've just got um, an inner cylinder that's grounded and an outer cylinder that's grounded and some sort of must be an intermediate thing somewhere that's got the high voltage on it. Oh no, actually no, it's, no, I was confused. Just because it's a green and yellow wire doesn't mean it's ground. Um, that's the input from the high voltage there. So that's connected to this inner cylinder here. And this outer feels like it's glass actually. I think it's a glass tube that's connected, that's grounded. So they're generating a sort of high electrostatic field between the that metal and this yeah, because there, there isn't actually a gas outlet in there, so I think the gas must be being directed. Yeah, if you look at the, this end seal, um, you see there's some holes inside. So what it's doing is it's we've got the O-ring that's sealing against here and here. So it's basically it's feeding the gas through this gap between this inner tube and the outer. Um, this outer bit's just wrapped in tape. I'm not sure if there's anything other than just the wire on that. All right, so we've got some foil on here. So we've got foil on the outer, then a layer of glass, then a, then a gap that the gas passes through. So it's just obviously um, putting a very high electrostatic field, but obviously the glass prevents the thing arcing over. Just thinking a bit more about this construction, I can see why, why they've done this the way, the way they have. Um, what you don't want in an ozone generator is high voltage and air outside the chamber, because you just get ozone coming out all over the place and it'll smell. So what they've done, the reason they've done it this way is they've wrapped the foil they've used sort of foil tape on the glass so you, there's no air um, between the foil and the glass to generate ozone outside of the, the reaction chamber. Obviously inside it doesn't matter because the gas is flowing through but um, they've sort of obviously they, they, they've wrapped this this outer shield is at ground potential but they've, they've wrapped it in tape to keep the air out but also they've by using this um, fairly thin metal foil conforms very tightly to the uh, glass so you don't get any air pockets underneath the uh, between the foil and the glass that will produce ozone outside the uh, main reaction chamber. And of course whenever you've got a nice high voltage transformer at hand you have to do the uh, obligatory uh, Jacob's ladder with it. Voltage on this one isn't ideal, but, uh, so it freaks the hell out of the voltage meter on this Variac. Incidentally, one thing I find can make Jacob's ladders sound a lot more impressive is just connect a small amount of capacitance across them. This is a 220 picofarad cap, because what happens then is as the mains voltage rises to the point where it strikes, there's enough stored energy in the cap to give it a much sort of snappier sound. This is the oven that uh, does the conversion between different types of nitrogen oxides, heating up to 350 degrees C. This will be a thermocouple 
temperature sensing. There's another, maybe the second thermal couple there because there's uh, another pair of wires going. That's maybe for testing, so you can just plug a meter in to um, measure the temperature, in temperature independently, and that's probably going to be the wires to the heater. This will just be adding my, uh, a phase controller, and there's a track under there, so this will be a mains heater with a um, simple track phase controller. Just control the temperature to a fixed level, there's no external, the, the only thing here appears to be a sort of power connection, so I'm assuming this is just sets it to a fixed temperature. Most of this is just um, rock wool thermal insulation. And we've got two uh, temperature probes in here, both of these I'm sure will be uh, thermocouples. Heating coil around there, um, and there's the like a glass bulb that the gas goes through, it looks like there's some substance inside the tube. That that's the, oh, I think mystery of this thing's been solved. This is um, a dryer assembly. Actually, um, got a company named Perma Pure Dryer. This company's still around, um, and this sort of works by transferring moisture from one F1 gas stream to another. All right, it looks like there's actually two sort of concentric tubes on here, which is why there was this this sort of big loop of um, tubing. So I think this. This in, in, inner is made of some magic substance that, that allows moisture to transfer through it to uh, dry one airstream by using the flow from the vacuum pump. Right, here's the main uh, reaction uh, chamber part where all the magic happens. One thing I noticed, they, this, um, they use this sort of plastic tubing uh, throughout the thing, but all the uh, tubes going into here have actually got black heat shrink over this so I'm sure this will be just to prevent these tubes acting like um, fibre optics and actually transmitting light into this because bear in mind yeah, this is going to be an extremely sensitive light detector so the last thing you want is your sort of plastic gas tubes conducting light into your um, reaction. Two big heat sinks on each side should be for the Peltier coolers. These two BNC connectors, these are the photomultiplier, there's the power supply and the um, signal output. And because the power supply is high voltage, it actually uses this BNC that's got some extended insulation. And these photomultipliers typically work at sort of low thousand volts or high hundred volts sort of range. Generally, there's a high voltage feed that that's then divided into several taps, typically say you know, between five and ten voltage taps. To drive the various electrodes and those resistors are generally incorporated into the base of the photomultiplier the thing that it actually plugs into which is usually made of teflon lots of polystyrene chips so this will be just thermal insulation because we're cooling the um, photomultiplier we don't want too much uh, heat leakage all right so we've got the um, photomultiplier tube here um, this may be a magnetic shield because it's an electron beam type device. They are quite sensitive to magnetic fields, so it wouldn't surprise me if there's um, something like a mu metal shield over it. Um, this, I'm guessing, will be a temperature sensor. You just see the Peltier element, there's one there, and there's one up here. So they're they're cooling the face. Cause I think the the only important thing on the on the photomultiplier, temperature wise, is the face of the tube because that's what turns the photons into electrons, so that's going to be the, uh, the bit you want to keep cool to reduce um, noise. Right, so there we have a uh, rather sexy looking uh, photomultiplier tube. And see there's some uh, metal foil around the outside, that's probably just help the, um, with the cooling. So this base will have the um, voltage divider in it. It's, it's a plastic, I don't think it's Teflon, but it's like a polythene type material for ultra low leakage. And it's got quite an interesting, I've never seen a motor multiplier that's got this purpley tint on the front window, but it may well be it's got some optical filtering, so it's only responsive to certain uh, wavelengths. Right, this photomultiplier is made by Hamamatsu, who are pretty much the only people that make photomultipliers these days. Got extended red response. Spectral response is designed for 300 to 900 nanometers with a peak at 600, which is a sort of right in the visible red. Supply voltage 1500 volts at uh, 100 microamps. Don't really, I don't really understand these specs very well, but um, yeah, the gain is 3.3 times 10 to the 5, so that's an awful lot of gain. Interestingly, it's showing 
dark currents after 30 minutes storage in darkness. So there's obviously some time related factors. So that this is basically it's, it's no signal current, which is seven nanoamps. So that's why the reason for all the high impedance um, low leakage stuff is actually pretty fast. It's got a um, nine nanosecond rise time and it's yeah, sensitivity 1.7 times 10 to the 4 amps per watt. In terms of detectable output that's going to detect some pretty uh, tiny amounts of uh, light. And the uh, gain is um, fairly linearly dependent on supply voltage so the gain goes from sort of just over 10 to the 3 up to um, well over a million once it gets up to 1500. And if we're looking here we can see here's the, uh, the mu metal shielding there and we've got a red filter so that's, that filter is going to be to um, only pass the the light wavelengths that we're interested in for that particular reaction. Right, let's take a look at the uh, the other end, this is the uh, actual reaction chamber. Looks like it's designed to come out fairly easily with these thumb screws. It looks like the motor has to come off to get that out. Um, this is a synchronous motor, these are quite common um, for sort of low speed applications. They're similar to a stepping motor, they typically have um, a capacitor to generate a phase shift so you supply them the mains voltage and they'll give a precise rotation speed which is dependent on the mains frequency. So that lock that uh, couples up with this the shutter assembly and we've got a simple photo interrupter that's uh, providing synchronisation signals so that everything else knows what position the, uh, the shutter's in. These I think are the injectors, I'm guessing are just basically holes of very precise diameter. Yeah they've got very small uh, holes in the side in the end there. So we've got this transistor here to act as a heater to uh, control the temperature. And yeah, we've got there's just a piece of glass that's been glued on here, so the gas obviously flows through this chamber, and it, and the uh, light comes out this uh, the window. So we've got these two two separate sections for the two different uh, oxides, and we can see the chopper here. This alternates light coming through one, and then the other chamber, and then black. So we've got a zero reference. This um, reaction chamber is just held on by grease. So obviously, this is something that will be part of regular maintenance to actually sort of clean all this crap out of here and uh, generally degunk it. So this is just held on, kept sort of gas tight just by the grease, but removable for uh, cleaning. You can see it's, these are the flow gauges from the front panel. These are just basically a tube with a small ball in them. They're actually really sensitive. I just just blow very gently sort of towards them. I'm not blowing into it directly. I'm literally just you know, I just try to find this vacuum pump up and it appears to be seized up solid because there's a sort of fan vent in the back and I can't even turn that at all with a screwdriver so I think this is got gunked up with something there's some sort of black inside here I wonder if maybe it's the um, carbon from the charcoal filters maybe gunged it up so let's uh, pull this apart and uh, so we can figure out what's going on Does appear to be a bit of a sort of rust and gunge in here. Oh, there we go. Seems to have freed it up a bit. Looks like this works by sort of these things hitting the wall by sort of centrifugal force. This, because this is in a bit, a bit of analytical gear, it almost certainly sort of doesn't isn't designed to work work with oil, as a lot of vacuum pumps are. So uh, just a bit of sort of rust and just general dirt in here that's. Uh, Probably what's jamming it. Yep. I like it. I think these are actually um, carbon, which would make sense as carbon sort of, sort of self lubricating. Yeah, that's, that's definitely carbon. So um, that's the lubrication mechanism. It's basically carbon on metal to avoid having to have any uh, oil in there. Right, there's a little uh, filter. Inside, there's a lot of rust in here, so this has clearly had some liquid in it at some point. Right, this thing's working. It's not a, not a particularly impressive vacuum pump. I all it's doing is it's pulling the gas through, but uh, do showing about 35 centimeters of mercury. That corresponds to about six psi, so um, might be okay for something like a vacuum pickup or something, but it's not going to make any. Uh, 
anything interesting like valves or discharge tubes or anything. Just having a quick look at this other unit I've got, which is the same model, it's actually slightly different. This has got some optional extra valves in it and there's a couple of extra ports on the back. And this is so you can switch between measuring your sample and measuring um, some known references. So you've got zero air, so that's you give it that to provide a zero reference with no oxides in it, and then you can give it a reference gas that's got a known concentration so you can actually calibrate the uh, span of the thing. And this, this thing on the uh, the back, the main inlet port, which is just a filter. There's a um, simple filter on here to avoid getting uh, any crap along your, along your sample. On this front panel that you don't see very often these days, there's a nice little uh, multi-turn pot with a little turns counting dial. So this, you know, before the days of Wizzy graphics user interfaces, this is actually quite a common type of control on precision instruments. It's sort of a multi-turn pot and a dial that keeps track of the uh, the turns so you can actually set a, a fairly precise value with immediate readback. There's a little locking thing there to lock the uh, value but uh, this is quite common on sort of precision instruments a few years ago. All right now onto this. This is a uh, pulsed fluorescent sulfur dioxide analyzer. Now this works on a different principle. Uh, the previous one relied on a chemical reaction generating light. This actually relies on fluorescence or sort of conversion of one wavelength to another. So um, this thing will have a light source in it as well as um, light detectors and probably some optical filters um, so that it's only detecting the wavelength of light from the fluorescence. And um, this is actually re electri electrically really simple. There's no processor at all in this. This is a completely analog piece of kit. So we've just got power supplies down here, some very simple analog stuff here, and there's a digital panel meter for the display. But so there's no ma major amount of processing. A few sort of simple analog amplifier type things. Um, the plumbing's a bit bit tidier on this. We've got sort of nice neat cable runs. Um, down here there's a little diaphragm type pump, and there's some uh, control valves to direct where the um, where the flow goes. On the back we've just got uh, the gas ports, sample exhaust, zero and span. So again, like the other one, the, we've got some calibration sources, outputs. Those will probably be analog voltage outputs. These have actually still got some plugs on. I'm sure these would have gone to uh, probably something like a chart recorder. This appears to date from around sort of 1990, judging by the date codes on the uh, chips there. Some of the controls are hidden behind this, so this is probably designed so this is the normal sort of running mode. And then set up in calibration, you can open this up. And you've got various sort of calibrate functions, um, adjustment. Again, we've got a photomultiplier in here, so we've got a gain adjustment for that. Here we have the um, working bits. These two here will be, I'm sure, to do with the photomultiplier. The gain adjustment was on the back of this can. So I'm guessing one of these will be the, that's actually maybe the high voltage supply, because the gain adjust was on here. And then there's probably an amplifier in here, because the coax cable going into there. And here we've got a uh, the temperature controller board. So this drives these two power resistors being used as heaters. These are 400 ohm resistors. And on the back here we've got a solid state relay and a little temperature sensor. So obviously being a sort of chemical process, this whole thing's going to be very temperature sensitive. So this thing's going to be designed to hold everything at a constant known temperature. Right, so this is the guts of it. There's just one, one input and one output for the gas. I mean this end with the, uh, the backs all potted. We've got this heater section in the middle. Um, I'm certain this is the photonized supply. We've got the two connections, power in and um, signal out here. And then there's something else at this this other end. This here which looks like I'm guessing that's probably going to be a temperature sensor. Alright, so this is the back end of the photomultiplier. This is going to be a, um, a standard base that's got all the resistive dividers in, again from our friends at Hamamatsu. And there we have a, uh, looks like a fairly standard side viewed um, photomultiplier. It's got, it's got this um, black black tape over it just to uh, shield it from external light. But that's a, I've seen seen these in a few things. They're a fairly standard photomultiplier. One P twenty eight. Yeah, that's a fairly standard type. Nineteen ninety one. And these are the electronics that um, control it. This is the uh, power supply. This is actually riveted together. And if we open it up, we've got this big potted area. So all the high voltage multiply will be in this potted area. And then just a simple uh, control there. 
And this is the uh, input stage. We've got uh, coax input here, moderately high, is about, um, about a 10 meg resistor on the front end, a few uh, LF411 FET op amps, and some reed relays. I'm guessing those would be to switch different gains in or um, the other thing is it's pulse fluorescent it's possible this might be doing some sampling or some uh, integration or something right, so I've got a, uh, a lens in here so that's presumably focusing what's, whatever's going on down here into the uh, photomultiplier interestingly we've got the temperature centre on this block but the heaters are on the block below but this is a big pretty hefty chunk of aluminium so the temperature of this is going to be Probably fairly stable across the whole whole, whole uh, thing. Actually, I'm not actually seeing anything through here. I wonder if there's a filter in there or something. Ah, oh, yeah, we've got a what looks like a, a black f filter. That's probably going to be something like an infrared filter. I'm guessing this is probably a very narrow band filter just to get the um, light of interest. Interesting. Um, I would assume that's probably some sort of light, sort of discharge light source. Seems to be sort of two sort of chunky square electrodes. Never seen something like that before. So there looks there's probably some circuitry. There's maybe if it's a discharge tube, there could be something like a um, high voltage igniter. Looks like there's actually a, a metal gas evacuation thing there. That says two four four. I mean, I suppose that could be two four four nanometers deep UV. Another interesting looking thing. Again, that's going through some optics. There's a seems to be four sections here. Maybe those are <coughs> filters or mirrors or something. There's no other electrical connection so it doesn't look like there's a shutter. Yeah these are mirrors and they look like they've got some sort of coating on them so um, these are probably designed to reflect specific wavelengths. It could even be the, the wavelengths that are written on the back here. Yeah these all look uh, Fairly similar. They they sort of just it's pretty hard to see on the camera. They do actually have a coating. You just see the edge of the coating. I'm guessing these are probably designed to reflect or absorb specific wavelengths as it sort of goes in and then bounces around four ways and then goes out the uh, into the main reaction uh, chamber. Well, actually, there's no apart from the heat. There isn't really any reaction going on on this thing. It's just basically it just looks like it's just sending the gas through. So it looks like it's probably purely a fluorescence reaction with the gas at a specific temperature. It's not you know, mixing it with ozone or molybdenum or, or anything like the previous one. It's, it looks like it's just sending the gas through, so it's probably looking for some very specific fluorescence characteristics. So I just noticed there's a part number on there, TEPN8666A. All right, I found a reference on eBay actually to this. This is actually a flash tube, so it's probably designed to produce a um, a flash at a specific wavelength, and that probably explains this. Is that this is probably going to be the trigger transformer in here to generate the high voltage to strike it. All right, so that leaves us with this end. So I suppose it could be something for monitoring the output of the flash tube. Hmm. All right, yeah, that looks like it's uh, something like a photodiode. There's also a little bit of circuitry inside there, so we'll get this wire through. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a photodiode, so that's, that'll be monitoring the uh, probably the intensity and or possibly the timing of the uh, flash. Right, I just had a quick look around online and I found the model, uh, the manual for the mo the, a later model of this from the same manufacturer. This this version uses a microprocessor control. Um, so yeah, we've got a sort of flash lamp supply, a gas uh, reactor, sort of a chamber there that um, the gas passes through, and basically the sulfur dioxide absorbs light in the ultraviolet uh, region. And lots of maths later. Yeah, here's a de more detailed uh, drawing. So we've got our a source, 
got a lens, we've got these four mirrors which are um, bandpass filters. So that's producing a very specific wavelength, filtering out all the uh, stuff we don't want from the um, flash lamp. Then it's going through some lenses, causing the fluorescence, and then being detected by the um, photomultiply down here. And then there's a photo detector there, which is presumably just picking up the uh, UV signal for feedback. And the sensitivity on this down to 0.1 parts per billion, oh, sorry, sensitivity on this is down to 0.1 parts per million um, and it can average signals and can get down to so over five minutes it can measure down to 0.25 parts per billion Right, so this thing doesn't use any um, chemicals or anything that needs sort of need replacing or filter or anything I'll put it all back together and see if we can actually get some uh, life out of it uh, horrible noisy noisy fan but we've got this flicker now th this flicker is actually quite bad it doesn't look that, that, look that much on the viewfinder but it, um, it's looking fairly nasty um, I think it's probably not right so um, I just tried just unplugging something from the main board and I noticed that when I unplug the photomultiply front end it sort of settled down and also the um, the controls seem to do things like the zero seems to work. You press the lamp voltage, and it you get a sort of a different uh, value. So um, I suspect there's something not totally right on that photomultiplier board. So as soon as I plug that in, it um, goes a bit nuts. Right, I've unplugged the pump for the moment because it's getting a bit annoying. Um, fortunately, there's some test points on this main board showing the voltage, and. Uh, uh, there's a plus 5 volt supply, looks right. Plus 15, but the minus 15 volts is showing minus 2.6, so there's clearly something not right there. And if we unplug that board, it goes back to um, minus 15, so there's clearly some power issue on that uh, photomultiplier amplifier board. Just having a look on the board, there's these um, capacitors, which I think might even actually be tantal liquid tantalum. I snip that one, which is on the negative rail, and Back to the back to its normal voltage, so it's clearly that capacitor had uh, died. Right, I'll just put a tantalum bead across that. It's only decoupling, so the value isn't going to be uh, particularly critical. Right, unfortunately, it looks like that cap wasn't the issue. Um, just notice, I, even without it in there, if I turn it on, although it starts at 15, it then drops down pretty quickly. So it um, looks like there's something else. Right, I just tried um, feeding an external supply into it. Um, through just from my bench supply, putting through a resistor just to avoid any melting. Um, I noticed that just by taking 20 milliamps from the bench supply, we're back up to 15 volts. So it looks like the 15 volt rail just can't supply enough current by a fairly small margin. So uh, it's probably um, getting either the regulator or the uh, smoothing cap. So it's right, it's putting the scope on the 15 volt rail. You can see it's actually dipping down. Actually, it's about 60 hertz, so that's not quite main. So um, Either something is pulling that down, I, I still suspect it may well be the regulator not being too happy. Let's just check the uh, supply going into the regulator. Right, we've got a fairly decent DC going into the regulator, so I think I'm going to replace that um, regulator. It's uh, just a um, 7915. Right, just before I go to the trouble of pulling that there, I've just um, broken into the minus 15 volt roll just to measure the power draw, and it's only pulling 23 milliamps, so that regulator is clearly not supplying. Um, enough current so I'm pretty sure it's the regulator that's gone. Also the fact that when I looked at the input on the smoothing cap we weren't seeing any big dips there I and mean, if it was pulling lots of current we'd have expected to have seen that dropping a bit more than it was so uh, I'm fairly confident that that's a problem with that uh, 15 volt regulator. Right, I just replaced that regulator because um, it wasn't drawing a lot of current I haven't bothered putting a heatsink on it I just replaced it with a uh, standard TO220. So we've got everything plugged in and now we have our minus 15 volt supply and our display is not flickering anymore so that looks like it. Right, without a manual it's a bit hard to know um, how you're supposed to actually operate these things. I feel we've got some fairly obvious controls we can turn the flash on, you can just hear it ticking away there. Um, one thing I noticed is when you ch the reading goes all over the place when you change ranges but it's, yeah, it's quite possible that you actually may have to do a complete recalibration whenever you change this range, I don't know. I'm mean, one issue with a display as simple as this is, you know, it's just giving you a number, or well, is that number valid or not, who knows. Um, I've actually seen it flashing under certain conditions which look like some sort of overload indication. I mean the zero just seems to sort of just about do something, although it's 
its effect and um, how sensitive it is does seem to vary quite a lot depending on what range you're on. Um, lamp V just gives a, I don't know, is that 850 volts or is that some sort of other arbitrary thing? I don't know. Alright, this thing seems to have just about settled down. Um, I sort of zeroed it. So I'm just going to see if I can um, get a reading. I'm just going to try and, um, melting some rubber with a soldering iron. I'd imagine that will produce some sort of vaguely sulfurous um, compound to see what happens. So I'm just going to sort of make a bit of smoke and just waft that into the um, in that oh that seems to have done something I don't really know what sort of time period this thing is designed for measuring over it could be that it's doing some fairly long averaging so I don't know how long it takes for it to actually permeate through the uh, system I expect that to sort of start dropping I guess that's Probably clearing out now, not quite sure why it's showing negative, unless it's something other than SO2 perhaps that it's reacting to, but uh, it does actually appear to be reacting to uh, something being put through it. It's now swinging back the opposite way from where I zeroed it, so I don't quite know what's going on there. Let's see where it settles down. Yeah, that's about uh, taking about two minutes to get back down to. Uh, fairly close to zero. Let's give it another whiff and see what happens. It does seem to sort of bounce up and down a bit. But it definitely is detecting something. It's odd it seems to sort of go negative and then sort of go back up positive again as it's presumably as the uh, gas is going through the system. It may well be there's all sorts of other impurities in that rubber that it's uh, reacting to as well so that might be uh, doing something weird but without any other uh, accurate gas sources I don't really know what it's doing but it is, does actually appear to be detecting something. Right, let's take a quick look at this um, second SO2 analyzer. I think this actually works on a fairly similar principle to that first one. Um, it, the meter sort of goes fairly nuts a lot of the time. It, I think there's some intermittent uh, issues here, the meter just sort of bounces around all over the place of its own accord, so I'm not going to spend any time doing any serious investigations, it's just sitting there going completely uh, strange. And the, there's also there's no pump on this one either, so you have to actually provide the flow externally. Um, this looks like a fairly old piece of kit, so uh, it's just going to be taken to pieces I think. Again, this is completely analog. There's some uh, chips with 1984 date codes in there, so it's sort of mid 80s. Obviously, all through hole, big old board, some sort of solid carbon composition resistors, so it's a uh, fairly old design. And we've got the reaction chamber here. Judging on the last one, basically, we've got um, there's a mechanical shutter here, and there's um, a UV discharge lamp instead of the flash tube is here. So that generates the ultraviolet. That then gets chopped by the chopper and then I'm guessing we've got the monitor photodiode here and the photomultiplier. There's a big fan under here so I'm guessing this might be another one using a, um, a Peltier cooled photomultiplier. The big old uh, main transformer on there. So down here we've got some massive great um, look like sort of polypropylene uh, capacitors, I'm guessing that might be for integration because there's actually a switch there saying time constant 1 or 60 seconds so um, I'm guessing these could be just to provide um, some integration. It's also what looks like a bunch of uh, read relays. The photomultiplier power supply is a self-contained supply, runs on 115 volts AC. So quite a lot of the things in this need one run on 115 and there's a 115 volt tap on the transformer so the different voltages there and you need to change the transformer tap and that then generates the uh, 115 for the fan and the um, UV tube. High voltage divider resistor there and some um, feedback. Yeah so just a main transformer rectifier to a low, low voltage DC and then there's a uh, this will be a boost converter to generate the high voltage and there will be some feedback to uh, regulate it. Right, so this is the, um, the reaction cell we've got. Uh, this is the light source. This is an ultraviolet um, discharge tube. 
Little uh, safety warning, saying not to look at the lamp because obviously these things kick out shortwave ultraviolet that can be quite dangerous to uh, look at. And here we've got the um, chopper, so we've got a uh, little photo interrupter up here to synchronise it. And that there's a shelf that goes inside and that's going to control the shutter in the path of the um, UV lamp. And that's just driven by a little simple shaded pole uh, AC motor down here. And I've taken the uh, the lamp housing off, there's just this little uh, disc here just producing a small aperture and you can actually see the shutter. You also see how the uh, the black paint's been um, bleached out by the ultraviolet. You can see it around here and also on the uh, the shutter it's actually uh, discoloured the paint. A lens or a filter or something in there because it's got quite a reflective um, surface. So again that'll be uh, some bandpass filtering to make sure it only kicks out the, uh, the wavelength that's of interest to uh, get the fluorescence happening. And like the other one we've got um, a heater and a temperature sensor. Great big thing full of empty which is the actual reaction chamber. And here's the actual filter and you can see on the side it's got um, 214 nm so that's going to be 204 nanometers uh, pass filter so it looks pretty much opaque to the eye because it's only designed to pass very shortwave ultraviolet. And again we've got a uh, lens here. Because this is dealing with short UV, these lenses may well be made out of quartz or some similar material because standard glass isn't very transparent to the um, these sort of short wavelengths. So these are probably fairly exotic, expensive bits of uh, optics. And I expect this is going to be fairly similar to the other one. It's probably just going to be a photodiode, albeit. Um, you tend to need fairly exotic photodiodes to get UV sensitivity, but uh, I suspect we've just got a photodiode and a photodiode amplifier in here. Yeah, actually, this actually looks very similar to the device in that um, the other unit. It's a very big can with a very large circular detector. I mean, it could be this isn't a photodiode. It might be some other type of um, detector. Um, the window sort of seems slightly slightly ripply, so maybe that's because it's made out of some slightly unusual material that they can't machine. There's actually a number on the side. I'll see if I can uh, find out any information about that. But um, yeah, so this, this will be some sort of ultraviolet sensitive detector. In fact the... Uh... Oh, there we go. Yeah, so it's actually in a little, uh, little glass package. I suppose it it's, it's could even be a little more, something more like a photoelectric cell than a photodiode because say silicon isn't very sensitive at um, ultraviolet wavelengths so it could actually be that uh, this is something more like an old uh, photocell than a photodiode. It's definitely a vacuum device of some sort. And this will be the other uh, photomultiplier again. This is looks like it's Peltier cool. We've got more uh, polystyrene insulation in here. Right, you can now see the um, Peltier cooler. So there's just a, an aluminium uh, jacket there with the Peltier cooler linking to the external uh, metal that's then fan cooled. Right, so in here we can see the um, here's the chain of resistors for the photomultiplier. So this just divides the high voltage supply down to get a, um, a number of intermediate voltages for the um, dynodes on the uh, photomultiplier. So it sort of encourages the electrons to go from the front backwards towards the um, is it cathode or the anode? I can't remember. Again, nice high value. Got a nice uh, 100 mega ohm resistor there. You don't often see a purple um, purple tolerance bands on resistors. There's a, a 10 meg here. Looks like there's maybe an amplifier or some other electronics on the back of this board as well. Yeah, so there's a few bits and pieces. This could just be something like a, um, a high impedance buffer stage just to be able to get the signal down the cable more easily. Is here, there's actually a red lead that's pointing in towards the base of the photomultiplier. Now I wonder if maybe that's for some sort of test function so that they can light the lead just to introduce a tiny little amount of light into it just as a, a quick way of testing that the um, photomultiplier is working and just enough light sort of percolates up. I mean this, this, this will actually come out as covered in bloody heat sink compound, this stuff gets everywhere. 
I'm going to actually come out and uh, yeah, this thing's covered in a horrible heatsink compound. Again, we've got this mu metal shield for shielding against magnetic fields, particularly, for example, for the fan underneath. Um, this is a fairly long photomultiplier. And once again, it's made by Hamamatsu. We'll clean all this uh, goop off of it and uh, Incidentally, a normal switch cleaner is actually quite good at getting rid of um, heating compound. It sort of comes off quite nicely, even, the, you know, even when it's really sort of dry, partly dried up and caked on. Right, so now we've got all that gunk off, we can actually see inside it. So we've got the, uh, the window at the front, and then there's the various electrodes, which are called dynodes, that um, have the electrons get multiplied as they get, as they bounce from electrode to electrode and end up at the uh, this far end. Well, I found some data um, on, it's not the exact tube bit, but it's an equivalent, it's designed as a direct drop-in replacement and it looks like its peak response is about 380 nanometers, it's 10 stages, uh, current we go 2.4 times 10 to the 6 gain and so this is the spectral response, it goes from about sort of 270 up to about 600 nanometers so it's sort of designed for the blue and UV end of the spectrum I can't actually see if it's got a quartz window. Here's a typical um, circuit. So you've got the odd high voltage supply and then these dividers to produce the um, progressively uh, decreasing voltage. And while I was in looking for info on that uh, photomultiplier, I actually stumbled across the information on this other small tube. It's an R765, uh, so it's a photoelectric cell, peak wavelength 240 nanometers, um, 8 millimeter diameter target. So spectral response from 160 up to 320 nanometers, peaking at 240. CST is that cesium tellurium target? Quartz window, obviously, anode supply up to 100 volts, peak output current 1.2 microamps. Recommended operating voltage 15 volts, so it's not a stupidly high voltage device, it's uh, relatively sensible. I'm sure it's probably powered by the standard plus minus 15 volt um, op amp uh, power supply. And in here, we're just going to have the probably another lens and also um, some more optical filters between the reaction chamber and the uh, photomultiplier. I'm guessing these lenses are sort of designed to just focus the, the light and the photomultiplier over a sort of large area of the reaction chamber just so you can get pick up the maximum possible uh, amount of uh, light. So I've got to the bottom of this hole. More screws. I know all these optics are made out of really big chunky lumps of aluminium. Obviously that's just sort of general practice in optical equipment for stability and obviously these things are designed for performance, not minimum cost. Yeah, these have been very specialist, very expensive bits of kit, built in, probably sort of hand built in, pretty low quantities. So they weren't really too bothered about sort of the odd pound of aluminium here or there. And also, also thermal stability is quite important for something like this as well. Again, the uh, the lens on this doesn't look in particularly great shape. It's sort of it's crazed and cracked. So again, there's another filter which you can't really see a great deal through. So that was an interesting little venture into the world of electro-optics and chemistry and uh, gases and stuff. Um, some nice interesting weird devices. Um, I will be having a play around with these photomultipliers at some point. I uh, don't have time at the moment um, and some of these bits probably will end up on eBay. Um, I'm probably going to stick the Pulsed SO2 analyzer and the other uh, uh, nitrous analyzers on eBay just to see if anyone's interested in them either, either as complete or for bits. If not, I'll strip them down and probably part them out. Um, say the photo, photo multipliers with power supplies might be useful to somebody in the vacuum pumps and so on. But, um, but um, so it's quite interesting to uh, again sort of one of my favourite things equipment which was very very expensive in its day and highly specialised. It's just really interesting to see uh, the inside of that sort of stuff.